Alexander Mark Maailmanpankista ja J.K. Salmon YK rahanrakentamisen tukitoimistosta tänne lavalle esittelemään. Gentlemen, please. So we, we will make a very short presentation, and sorry it's in English. Our Finnish is not sufficiently good to be able to present in this language. But uh, thank you very much for having us here. Uh, Jago Salman from the UN will start with a bit of diagnostic of the situation of conflict today. And then I will come up I'm from the World Bank with the recommendation that has come out, out of this report. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you for inviting us to Helsinki. It's my, my first time in, in Finland. Um, the, this is the report came out of the bank and the UN coming together in 2016, uh, just before the uh, campaign of the Secretary General, to do a deep policy dive on the, the politics and the substance of, of preventing violent conflict. We, we looked at 15 countries which had moved away from, from violent conflict, as well as undertaking around 40 thematic studies um, to build the evidence base in here. Now, the reason why the Bank and the UN came together around this agenda is <laughs> essentially because what we saw, what we've seen since 2010 or 2004, depending on how you measure your curve, is every single quantitative indicator on violence, on violent conflict that we measure has gone up significantly. Whether you're talking about the number of civil wars, you're talking about the number of displaced populations, the number of refugees, the number of terrorist attacks, the number of civilian casualties in war, the number of countries affected by war, every single one of these numbers has climbed since 2010. At the same time, what you see is a major qualitative shift in the kinds of conflicts that we're dealing with. Wars today uh, are, primary, are primarily civil wars, um, they're waged by non-state armed groups um, fighting each other or fighting state militaries. Um, they're explicitly cross-border, so not only regional, um, but they're also fighting across borders, no longer seeking to capture the state. Um, this is true in the Middle East, but it's also true in West Africa, in, in East Africa. And then two other very disturbing trends around this is that one is that they're increasingly protracted. Wars that ended in 2014 were on average 26 years long. This is a trend that has continued um, from about the since the 1980s, where the, the basic fact is, is if you went to war in the 1960s, 20 years later, you would be much more likely to be in a pathway to development than if you went to war in the 1990s. We need to, be start, we need to start talking not about one incident of violence or one cycle of violence, but recognizing that many wars are becoming very protracted um, periods of instability, either continuous conflict or repeated cycles of violence. The last trend that meant that well, which we looked at the, 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 the dynamics of prevention was this internationalization, which is defined to not as proxy wars, as, as economic support for other people's conflicts, but the direct deployment of third parties' armies into another person's civil war. The graphs that we have in the report show that this has also steadily climbed since about 2004, 2010. So when, the other big shift that we've seen these numbers tell us that the, the, the on the previous slide tell us that while in 2008, 2009, 2010, the management of civil wars was, was very much about managing residual crises, crises that are happening on the margins of, of a rapidly developing international system. What we see today is that war has become again somewhat central um, to the questions around development, not just in low-income countries in, in Africa, but in middle-income countries. Um, with also violence becoming more diffused and affecting many European countries, whether it's through, through terrorism or directly changing uh, security policies in, in countries very far away from the battlefield. The other dynamic that we saw that contributes to this shift is that very few of these wars are purely local um, anymore. Many of the wars are intersecting with macro, regional, or global trends, uh, that, where there was having a huge impact that we've discussed a lot in Western countries but we need to be discussing much more in, in developing countries. The, the ICT story has been a huge story in, in the West, 
the, the front page news of the New York Times a month and a half ago was about the role of Facebook in, in the conflict in Myanmar. Um, the migration crisis has been heavily discussed in terms of Europe. It's also a major um, impact on the countries of West Africa where populations are leaving rural areas into towns and leaving um, countries to move into the, the migration trail. So a lot of the wars that we're looking at today are no longer resolvable just by fixing problems out, out there. They need more collaboration at regional level and global level to address the underlying risks that are fueling them. The, the, the Secretary General made a statement to the Security Council six weeks ago where he, he pleaded the Security Council to recognize that the risk profiles of many countries are changing, that this may not be a, a, a surge in conflict that goes up and goes down that actually if you look at some of the underlying risks related to these global factors, we may be moving into a period of greater instability um, in the world. The last, the last key point is that with these changes in dynamics in conflict, what you're seeing is that the, the international consensus about how civil war should be managed is declining. Most evidently in the Security Council, uh, where the Security Council is struggling to reach agreement on collective solutions. What this means is the, gra the graph on the, the left. For the last 30 years, the international system in support of national actors has been fairly successful at ending one or two more year, uh, wars a year than was started, which is the orange bar is conflict onset, the blue bar is conflict termination. What has happened since 2010 is you have a surge in the number of conflicts starting, but at the same time you've seen a stagnation in the number of conflicts being terminated. And that is, that is challenging an international regime which is primarily based around three core interventions. Humanitarian relief to protect life with dignity, mediation um, to achieve negotiated settlements, and, and peacekeeping to provide security guarantees. All three of these core tools are essentially effective. But what you see on the numbers on the right is that the, th this model of managing conflict is increasingly under strain. There's a lot of political discussion around how much these are, are, are costed, which is breaking the consensus in many ways on how they should be handled. The, the one core message I want to leave, leave with you on this part of the presentation is that for many years, the best approach to conflict at the international level has been to manage the problems out there. Is that we've been looking at this in terms of one peacekeeping mission, or one peace tre uh, uh, treaty, or one treat each every crisis in and of its own right as a single crisis. Um, with much less focus on prevention. Much, much more money is going into humanitarian relief or peacekeeping than it is going into preventive And that the business case for prevention is rapidly changing. Um, the one number I'll leave you with is that if we spent a billion dollars on preventing violence um, breaking out, a billion dollars being the cost on average of a multi-dimensional peacekeeping operation, and that intervention fails three out of four times every year, we would still be saving on average $5 billion a year. And if you compound that with the idea that conflicts are increasingly protracted, are increasingly long-lasting, these are savings that are, that are compounded every year. As long as the, the number of conflicts continues to rise, and we are unable to terminate these conflicts, this business case is going to get stronger and stronger. Call and call a much stronger investment in a real preventative system, rather than just a responsive. Thank you. So now I'm going to move, what does it mean for all of us in terms of being more effective on prevention? Well, the first thing I think we have is that all our prevention efforts are focused on uh, crisis. And we believe very strongly in the role of diplomacy and mediation, which is true, it's important. But conflict builds over a very long period of time. The crisis is only when the conflict actually comes to maturity. And during this period of time, usually there's not much that is done, whether by government or by the international, uh, the, the international community around the prevention. So prevention needs to start much before crisis. Uh, and it needs to remain a focus of attention much after the crisis. And that's the big change that all our international communities, but also government, needs to do. The second point is that if you look at the risk of conflict much earlier than the crisis and much after, that's where development policies become very important. Economic, social, institutional development. And this is really the missing part of prevention up to now. 
in most cases, we focus our development policies on poverty, on growth, which is important. But we forgot that development policy can have a major role in actually dealing with the grievance of the population and dealing with prevention of violent conflict, both before crisis and after crisis. So I think that's the message of the report. But also the third message that I want to leave with you before I go into this graph is that development policy alone will not do it. Mediation alone will not do it. Security provision alone will not do it. Today, with the complexity of the system, this is the connection between those three that can make a difference, both by countries themselves and by the international community. So we came out with uh, three principles. The first principle is that those interventions need to be targeted at the causes of uh, conflict. Just normal development is not a guarantee against conflict and fragility. Today, there's more country that are uh, actually uh, middle income countries that fall into conflict than countries that are poor. So the fact that you're a poor country becomes less and less a uh, correlate of uh, being at conflict. That's a big change in the conception we have of conflicts today. Uh, the second point is that uh, poverty reduction, uh, growth, uh, even equity is, is are important factors, but you also need to target really the elements uh, that directly cause conflict, whether they're grievance or the, whether there's the sort of war economy or other other factors there. So we need to be targeted. We need to target our policy to uh, of prevention to really the risks. The second thing is that inclusion is absolutely central. I would say inclusion and inclusion and inclusion. This is what should be at the center of conflict prevention when you start before crisis. But inclusion is not straightforward. Inclusion is not only a class issue, it's not only about the poor getting into the society. It's about different groups. Some might not be the poorest actually being having a role in, the, in their society. And that means that inclusion is something that is complex to negotiate, is very difficult, and requires losers and winners, and require a very careful management by the government and the international community. The first thing is that you have to sustain the support. We have a very short attention span when we work on prevention. We put a lot of money at the time of the crisis, but what will make a difference is sustaining it much before the crisis and much after the crisis. At the same time, today, conflict, as Jago said, move from different level, from, uh, from uh, community to uh, sub-regional, to national, to international. So we need to be able to take that into account also in the way we work. I'm just going to move uh, very, very quickly uh, the, the other uh, uh, area. We have eight area that we uh, focused on. One is the geographical area that is extremely important. We have a geographical dimension in all conflict. The second is the issue of natural resource, security, and justice, which are still three areas where a lot of the conflict tend to focus. The third one is the role of the state, corruption, accountability of the state, that is absolutely central in the dynamic of conflict. And finally, the access of service, not because people take arms because of lack of services, but because uh, service is the element that allows the legitimization of the state, and then the state can be more able to resolve some of the conflict. The, the, the four other areas are really the role of women in peace building. I'm not going to, to tell to, what, uh, to such an audience about how important it is, because I know you know, but a lot of the study we've made, with a lot of the um, review that we have done, show that more equitable uh, 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 society with more equity, especially in terms of education and access to livelihood between men and women are much more resilient to conflict. The role of youth is very important, as we know, and also how to manage shocks. That's something we tend to forget, that macroeconomic adjustment on one side and prevention on the other side needs to go much more hand in hand. And finally, the capacity of country to deal with all those global issues that we've talked before. Another really important issue is how we, we work 
across development, security, diplomacy, and humanitarian assistance. All the countries that have succeeded in prevention had this approach that we call a little bit, uh, that we call the, the, the spaghetti approach, which is in some ways they have played with one another in a very flexible fashion, uh, with a lot of interaction between those different levels. And, uh, and we, uh, the international community, follow much more the graph on this side, which shows that we're extremely uh, uh, narrow and focused on silos. So we're not able to help adequately the countries that are uh, trying to uh, implement prevention. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, and we're going to continue uh, straight uh, to the panel question. So if you can please join me up here. Also, uh, a few others. Pyydetään lavalle kansanedustaja Pekka Haavisto ja ulkoministeriön kehitys, kehityspoliittisen osaston päällikkö Satu Santala. Oh, you want to sit there? <laughs> Please join us. <laughs> okay, let's stand. Pekka has a good point. You might not see us, although we are tall people. Findings of the report, and let's uh, let's open a little bit uh, some of some of the uh, points that were touched upon. Uh, Pekka, I want to start with you. Um, you have a lot of experience with mediation, and uh, in the report, one of the findings was that uh, conflicts are more and more complex. So, what does this mean for uh, Finland's role in mediation right now? Thank you. I, I, I think the report Pathways for Peace is an uh, excellent work because it's really linking the mediation issues, the prevention issues, but particularly the development issues that this kind of uh, peace and peaceful societies can be an overarching goal even for development, even for humanitarian assistance and, and, and so forth. And I, I think the last issue that you gentlemen raised up, the, how we work in the silos, when we are helping countries, our security people and our development people and our humanitarian people and so forth are separate, even our official support and then our NGOs and, and so are not always well coordinated and I think it doesn't really work. I have been using as an example that when we faced the refugee crisis, suddenly many countries actually said, aha, now the people from the foreign ministries couldn't do this, so let's send the ministries of justice and ministries of interior to negotiate how, with the, for example, with the development money, we can buy, buy us out of this problem and how we can maybe send the refugees back and, and, and so forth. And, and this is a very good example of this very siloed thinking. Uh, in addition, I, I, I think you, you have been referring many times to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and how that can be used as a roadmap. And, and I think this uh, big uh, challenging issues in the future, whether we speak about uh, uh, the population issue, population growth issue, or climate change and others, which probably have uh, fundamentally changed the, the concept of a conflict in, in many countries and many areas. So I, I think the work that you have been doing has been excellent in this regard. Okay, so most, most of this uh, uh, mediation and conflict management doesn't happen between states anymore because it, it, the actors in the conflicts are, are much more meaningful than just between states. So what kind of different kind of tools or, or uh, ways to work do we need? since it's not that straightforward between states anymore. Do you gentlemen want to comment? I think the, the most difficult will be to get those different aspects together. So we need to find tools that bring mediation much closer to the efforts of development, that bring mediation much earlier, uh, that bring security uh, much more in contact with the development. All those, that, that's really what, what modern conflict requires. There requires all those connections. But that's very, very difficult because it also has to be done at the level of the country. And there's always this issue of sovereignty that comes out. How much do the donors have the right 
when they are working in the country, the moral right actually to get involved in those issues of relation between those different uh, elements. Sato, you, re you represent the state over here. How do you see this? Well, um, I do think that we need several different kinds of tools, but I, I, we can't ignore the state, as, as you said. Uh, in, in a given context, the state, anyway, uh, is there, and uh, if you think of long-term development, uh, you do need uh, structures and institutions that can carry forward uh, development and, and building society. So I think we shouldn't ignore that. But of course, uh, a lot of work has to happen at the level of communities, um, uh, different, between different communities, um, and different kinds of actors. But, but the world is becoming very, very complex. One of my colleagues, Yusuf Mahmoud, on this precise point, he says, you got to understand that most states aren't there to build peace. Most states are there to declare war or end war. But the, the job of building peace is society's job. It's civil society, it's communities. They're the ones that will build the resilience to conflict. In all the cases that we looked at where prevention was successful, it wasn't one leader. It was a coalition of actors from business sector and civil society that were able to take often very unpopular decisions in favor of preventing and reducing the violence. Okay, so what, one difficult question is uh, obviously uh, uh, how do we include all the groups and who do we include? Becca. Uh, this is a really challenge uh, because when we look at the conflict, actually marginalization is very often the, one of the original reasons of the conflicts and we are still very blind actually in many societies, sometimes even in our own society when we speak about our Roma community or our Sami community actually who has been reading in the school books anything about these uh, minorities, not at least me, because there was no text about our own minorities. And this is of course the situation in many, many countries in the world that marginalized groups are marginalized also from the information and, and from the school books and, and, and so forth and, and somehow not linked to the society. I, Remember when I visited Central African Republics and there are many people who moved from Chad 100 years ago. And then when you talk to people in the capital that what about this Chadia minority and so forth, they said, well, they came only 100 years ago, so they should go back. And this is of course the Rohingya, fate of the Rohingyas in, in uh, Myanmar and, and so forth, that people feel that these people don't belong to our country and let's send them away. So this inclusion has to be real. Uh, uh, in, in this sense. And, and then the other issue, of course, is the very complicated issue which could be labeled as talking to terrorists because many people are labeled as terrorists because either their uh, political action or sometimes based on their military action and very many peace processes, unfortunately, need talking to these people, whether it's Taliban in, in Afghanistan or, or even al Shabaab in Somalia and so forth. And, and actually the limitation is very much on us. How can we talk? How can we handle these groups? Of course there has to be rules and so forth, but we cannot just wish away these groups. And I, I feel very often that in our own society or in the European Union, we, we might think, oh, these are terrible Islamists, or these are terrible this, and these are terrible that, and we make the limitations ourselves. But how, how do you make the decision who you talk to? I mean, is, 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 is there a line that you can't cross, like these people we, we just can't talk to? Or how, how, how do you decide? Well, well, I have been talking to people who are terrorists listed by you and, and, and US and so forth. Of course, you make some preparatory work with these institutions to, to explain what you are doing, to get the green light, so to say, for some of these main things. But then, then, of course, the question is always testing these people. Are they ready to quit the violence? Are they ready to walk to the peace agreement? Are they ready to maybe stop some of these uh, insulting practices among their own communities? Let's say Boko Haram is a typical example that, yes, you can talk to Boko Haram, but of course it cannot be unconditional talk. You, you have uh, also requirements. If they join the peace process, there are certain requirements they have to fulfill. Um, if, if we look at society at large, uh, the tendency right now is that people are more and more in their own, what we call here, bubbles. 
they have uh, stronger and stronger opinions and, and they associate with people who have the same opinion and, and especially on social media we see this. So if, if that happens in uh, conflict-free societies, how can, how can we expect to resolve conflicts where, where there is a real problem? What do you think? One of, one of the surprising findings that we saw in this study is prevention is often profoundly unpopular um, amongst broader society. What you see is people want security, justice, and opportunity, while prevention often requires including and, and sharing. And what you see is that you get a very different reaction from different countries to this, to this agenda. Countries that have gone through their own conflicts or have lived through a war often fully understand that their security can no longer come from the barrel of a gun. But it's quite a profound moment where the, this realization is there is no security response to these insecurity challenges. And it builds the coalition to address these incentives, to target the, the lack of popularity, to push out the idea that we need to find more inclusive solutions. And just to say, that isn't just, you find it in Europe, but you're also beginning to see this reflection coming out of other countries in, in, in Africa as well, for example, where there's a profound realization, often after several years of using military force, that there is no military way out of this country, that they really need development assistance in particular, along with international support, to target the, the grievances of their, of their, their populations. But we shouldn't pretend that this is a popular or an easy agenda for precisely this reason. Well, if, if there is a lot of exclusion and, and there's even poor governance going on at the conflict areas, uh, Sato, what can we do uh, with development aid to uh, address these issues? Yeah, this is, uh, of course, at the core of, of development policy and development work. How do you build societies where everyone can prosper and, and where everyone is included? In Finnish development policy, we've been emphasizing this for a very long time, uh, but it is not very easy to do, obviously. So I can't say that we've solved the issue. Um, but focusing on, for example, uh, understanding who may be excluded or are in danger of being marginalized is critical. Um, making sure that, that women and men are included, making sure that um, that uh, ethnic groups uh, are included, um, geographical distribution, as well as then people with disabilities and so on. Uh, but the, it of course there is a lot within uh, or, or in, in different contexts. But, but governance is key, so making sure that, that there is inclusive governance. Um, and this is not only at the state level, but of course if you, for example, talk about water services, how do you make sure that everyone in a locality has has access or decisions are made in an inclusive way. And this applies to, of course, our bilateral aid, but then, of course, for example, the World Bank, the UN organizations, uh, civil society organizations who work with development and that, that we channel our funds through, that, that this is there. Uh, in recent years, we've also done a lot of work on, uh, on our human rights-based approach. Um, it started out uh, from the same kind of understanding that um, that it's important for us to make sure that whatever we do, we don't by mistake, for example, um, make things worse in a society by, uh, for example, reinforcing power of some people and, and reducing that of others. And for us, human rights-based approach means um, quite at the practical level, understanding um, what, the, what the situation is in a given country, making sure everyone's included, uh, and so on. So we can do a lot, it's really difficult to do, but, but that's the only way. Well, in conflict situations, uh, development aid usually has to take a step back, and crisis management and humanitarian aid will become the focus. Why is this maybe not a good plan? Yeah, of course, uh, you know, we sort of doing stop and go development where, you know, one, one year you develop school programs, for example, and the next year you don't, it, it's not going to create you give good results and then um, uh, all kinds of uh, side effects are there. It's not very easy, though, to, to continue throughout and at least what you need to do is to adopt your programs to make sure that you are sensitive to the situation that is there and also that you do things that are possible. Sometimes, obviously, there are sanctions in place and, and they are needed, and then, uh, you know, governmental uh, development aid uh, is not possible. However, humanitarian assistance or security sector assistance may still uh, be valid, and then you have to make sure that 
those approaches are sufficiently overlapping with the developmental approach. Um, and then um, there are situations where, for example, multilateral institutions can continue working in a country which is in a very difficult situation, uh, while we cannot with our bilateral programs, and there are staff security issues and so on. But, but it is, of course, important that we try our level best to, to make sure that we're involved. And we have good examples. I mean, Finland has a fairly good track record of not immediately pulling out of countries when there is trouble. For example, Nepal is a country where we stayed engaged all throughout the difficult times and uh, with some uh, fairly good results. Becca, you worked a lot in the field, so uh, how much have you seen examples of this, that there's been some good development aid and projects and then the conflict heats up and, and the work stops and that's not very beneficial? Well, I, I, I think Gaza or Palestinian area is a good example that we again and again build the hospitals and we again and again build the water networks and then they are destroyed by the, by the war, but fortunately most of the development work is not, not like that. I would actually raise two issues on, on, on the role of the private sector because nowadays Finland is also very much stressing that uh, creating the jobs and, and having the private sector working is, is very influential but, but there are of course limits how much risks the private sector can take and we, we cannot just push Finnish companies to the conflict areas or, or very fragile states where there are no institutions. You have to have uh, some supportive uh, mechanism to that. And another issue which I think we could use more is our diaspora. We have an excellent Somali community in Finland. These people are doing a lot of pendling between Helsinki and Mogadishu. First we were a little bit upset that why you are already here in Helsinki, why you go back to Mogadishu? But many of them had their relatives, had their businesses, want to support their family, larger family members there and actually could create businesses there. We have a very uh, lively Tamil community from Sri, Sri Lanka in Finland. These Tamilis are in the middle of Finnish business. They are cleaning our buses in the nights and uh, recruiting more and more young people nowadays to their businesses. They could maybe do something more in the future to rebuild their own country and Tamil areas in Sri Lanka, but probably some mechanism are needed, some support to them to do that, or some guarantees that they, their investments are not going in vain. So actually we, we can use quite many tools, and even new type of tools, on, on enhancing the, the economic life in, the, in these areas, and I think it's very important. Let's continue on that, Jerko and Alexander. What do you think, how do, how do we use the diaspora better? And make them build their own countries. Yeah. So I think I think we're more and more in a global society, right? So people move and people are on the move much, much more than any other time. They're in the move because of conflict, but they also move for, for many different reasons. This is also something with the state as they are structured that we are not able to manage well, right? So for very good reasons, right? Because with the move comes cultural change, comes all sorts of differences. Now, we have to adapt to many of those, those elements, and I agree that we need to use uh, this population on the moon in a much more uh, constructive way. Most states is that as dangerous, whether it's, we have to remember, by the way, that the problem of migration in Europe is only very small in comparison to the problem of migration that you see in the, in the developing countries. All the civil war in Ivory Coast was linked very much to migration from the north. The pressure you have on Lebanon and Jordan now, many of those issues are actually a real problem, and much more serious, I would say, in developing countries. We need to find new ways. I don't have here some, something to give you, but we really need to adapt uh, very rapidly to this very rapidly changing world. That's your next report, but still, <laughs> Jay, go. <laughs> this is the, I think I mentioned that the Secretary General's point of the Security Council, which is the, the about six the risk profiles of many countries are changing. One of the things that we discussed intently for this report was, is the current surge of conflict just a, a blip? Will it go down once, once the war in, in Syria is won, um, once the war in, in Yemen is solved? Um, or are we going into a period of greater instability? Is, this, is Pinker right? Stephen Pinker is he right? And, and I think what we see is, we don't know at the moment, but what we see is the world is becoming much more complex. 
and many of these underlying risks are, are, are growing. And what you hear from many actors, both civil society, you, you hear it um, in countries, you hear it from, from a number of countries, is that we can't keep looking for the solutions to all of these problems um, in, in security responses or crisis management, that we have to begin to recognize the, the origins of this. And this is where I think you, you mentioned earlier the, the idea of risk um, guarantee, or the aspirin to invest back home. We're seeing now, for example, the bank um, investing heavily to support Jordan and Lebanon on the management of the, the refugee populations. This is not being left just to humanitarian response. This is being provided to a concessional finance facility. You see the African Union beginning to talk about tax on commodities um, in the region that pay for a much more institutionalized peace and security architecture rather than one that is just dependent upon the West paying every time there's a crisis. And I think what we're saying here is that we need to stop treating these conflicts as if they're all out there with just some money to pay for humanitarian response, which works, and money to pay for small peaceful activities. But we need for the next phase of development we need a much more comprehensive response um, to these crises. And you're beginning to see this shift. If you look at the, the, the latest European statements on prevention, this is a much more holistic view of prevention. If you look at the, 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 some of the German statements on prevention, there's a much more holistic view, recognizing that these crises are now coming home, they're coming here, and that if we, we can't simply close ourselves off, we're going to have to find more comprehensive, more developmental solutions and responses. And that includes the well, uh, you, you mentioned in the report, and, and you touched upon it right, uh, right, right now, that conflicts build over a long time, and the prevention needs to start a long time before we have a real crisis. How do you do that? If, I mean, if you look at uh, uh, Europe 2015, when we had uh, the whole immigration wave come our way, and we, we were sort of, I guess, I guess we say in Finland, we were, we were caught with our pants down, I guess you say that in other places in the world as well. So how do we prevent from that from happening in the future? If, if, if the prevention needs to be all on a long span. Well, at least one, one issue are these, what we call weak signals or, or early warning issues. You, you can very easily, for example, if you go to the Balkans, what happened to the, in the former Yugoslavia, we, we, we could see that actually a certain level of the hate speech, hate speech in the media and so forth was, was there quite a long time before the conflict break, break, broke out. And, and similar maybe if you look at the Rwanda situation and so forth and so forth, there were early warnings and even warnings to the international society, international community, you should do more of this. But it wasn't done and I, I think we should uh, become much more sensitive on this and I think what the gentlemen are, are proposing in the report that also those who are doing the development work should be much sensitive on this political issue. We, we maybe don't want to politicize the development work but if, if in the development work you don't you don't have a sense of marginalization, if you have, don't have the sense of hate speech and this kind of things which are the early signals then you probably lose uh, everything in the end of the day for, for the conflict. So I think that, that's at least one, one issue. And, and second, I, I would really stress the role of the civil society and civil society actors because states are slow moving, but the NGOs are very rapidly moving actors. And, and sometimes in Finland we want to also to coordinate very much and, and, and somehow organize the civil society, but the civil society is at best when it's going by itself with its own rules. And, and maybe working in those areas, those countries, those regions that we cannot as a state uh, act and then giving those early signals that something is going wrong here and something should be done. The NGOs are excellent, both the local NGOs there on the level and then of course the international NGOs doing that work. Well, I mean, the report emphasizes uh, still that the states have the primary responsibility to uh, to prevent uh, conflict. And, and you're a politician, and you know that governments change all the time, and, and the balances of of, uh, of politics and uh, development and so forth. So, how do you get politicians to listen to the early signs? Well, of course, it's first of all, it's important that we have resources for the for the development work. I I really. We have to be a little bit ashamed as, as Finns because we, 
He said a couple of years ago that we are in the middle of economic crisis, so we have to take down our development cooperation. And now we are luckily not in the middle of the crisis, but we still have down these figures. And that, of course, means that we are not, we, we cannot finance all those actors that are needed for the conflict prevention. Many of our NGOs have, have a lack of funds currently and others. And of course, which is bad for Finland, we are dropping out from those circles which are discussing these issues. We are now more invited in the certified groups in the EU or UN and so forth, so we lose our international influence. And, and also, vis-a-vis -vis our Nordic uh, uh, friends, when we are on the level of 0 0.35 and they are on the level of 0 0.7 or even 1%, we, we, we are no more in, in that Nordic group either. So, so to be very honest, I think whenever the next government negotiations are there, I, I think again we should come back on, on, on that track and, and also supporting not only the state uh, development cooperation but also these international NGOs, UN system and so forth on these issues. And I think we have a very good heritage on peace building, we have Aftisari, we have CMI, all that work that has been done. And I, I, I think we could build on that with actually those findings that you have what what a new type of, of new new type of system where you take also the development factors we, we could build in quite a lot on, on, on that heritage. Tato, do you want to comment? Yeah, I just wanted to add to that uh, excellent um, excellent points from Pekka. Uh, just on the risks, I think there are two or there are several, but I I, I wanted to mention two um, sort of bigger risks, global risks that we should really be uh, taking seriously. Uh, one is obviously climate, um, because it is increasing uh, instability, uh, and and, uh, and it is it's a serious issue that's not only an environmental issue, but it is uh, it has very much links to to uh, security as well. Uh, and then the other one um, is uh, the, the learning crisis, the global learning crisis, where in increasingly in developing countries we've been able to to, to have access to almost every child to education. However, that education is giving them too little. Um, in the worst cases, uh, in many countries, children are learning almost nothing, uh, even though they sit in schools for years. And this is something that is very dangerous because uh, you know young people that you know don't get any opportunities through their education. Uh, it, it's it's not a good good uh, situation to be in. So it may be a country that is not uh, close to a conflict right now, but as you said earlier this builds up over a very long time. So we should not be really looking at only countries that are at the verge of conflict, but the all of the developing countries. I wanted to ask Alexander, since you represent the World Bank, which we don't immediately associate with uh, conflict prevention, why does the World, world Bank so take an interest? So the, the reason is that we've been doing a number of studies, we always do studies and produce numbers, that's one thing we do. So we came out and we realized that a country at risk of conflict will host probably in 2030 60% of the poor. So the reason why people will be poor will not be anymore so much their condition of start because a lot of countries that don't have progressing uh, or don't have the impact of climate change, which is also very important. But the conflict and the crisis will be the number one cause of poverty we will see. And so before you, you cannot return being an institution that works on reducing, reducing poverty without trying to do more for avoiding the conflict. If not, we won't be able to be effective at our work. Let's round up this discussion with some good news, I hope. Um, can you give me an example of a conflict maybe a past conflict, where um, this cooperation between all the different uh, actors that we've talked about has actually worked. Something that we can yeah. copy in the future, so, maybe. You know, there's a, we, we, we studied in depth 15 cases of countries. I don't think any, any of those countries were perfect, but far. Uh, there's one country that I really follow quite closely, which is Niger in the Sahel. Uh, now this country is really interesting because a lot of the recommendation we have in the pathways report they've actually implemented. They had a very inclusive political system where they got the Tuareg 
as their prime minister now for five years, while Tuareg represent only 16% of the population, who would do that in terms of dealing with inclusion, uh, where they had a really balanced uh, civil service in terms of the different groups coming in, where they had a plan for security and development for the north of the country, where they have an agency of mediation that used development as one of their additional uh, uh, way of uh, supporting their efforts with the early warning system. Now, it's not an astonishing thing that despite of the problem in Niger, Niger has not gone into the type of trouble that Mali has gone, or even to some extent that Mauritania has gone. They actually had good preventative policies. And then when government has good preventative policies, much easier for the donors to align behind them. So for me, it's one of those cases. There are other cases that I mentioned, some aspects of Indonesia and others. But one big measure of the study is that we find cases where government have done the right things. And this was the government specifically that had the good plan. I mean, a, a, another, another case that we look at very closely in, in the UN is the case of Gambia. Um, and I, I think it's really important to understand that a lot of our systems for managing conflict are imported directly from the managing of interstate war. When most of the conflicts that we're managing today are beginning as, as domestic disturbances that are then escalating into civil war. So waiting to respond to the violence in the way that you may do with an interstate war is often in too late. What you saw in Gambia was a, a very careful coalition of actors um, coming together to manage a, a political crisis, working with civil society, working directly with the youth. One of the things that they were doing when the president refused to step down after the election was to go out and talk to the young people over, every day and say, I know that you would like to fight, but don't fight because you're going to lose. Um, and at the same time, reaching out to the, the region, the Senegalese in particular, um, and mobilizing ECOWAS, who um, 15 years ago had made a real decision that they were not going to let this region continue to collapse into conflict because it was very bad for the economies of Nigeria, it was very bad for the economies of Senegal. And they actually had an architecture in place that allowed them to legally move Nekowas force to the border of Gambia, which then led with a coalition of actors from global to the regional to put direct pressure on the president and provide him an avenue out of the country and allow for a peaceful transition of power. The, the one last thing I'd say is that that's not the end of it. That was the beginning of the problem. If you think about the sustained part here, the two weeks after that, the new president was, was talking very, very passionately to the UN because his bodyguards, his close protection, were all from Senegal because he couldn't rely on the presidential guard who had been hand-picked for 25 years to provide his personal security. This is a long-term transition. That immediate management of the crisis just lays the foundation for now what must be a process of institutional reform and addressing those original grievances that led to the crisis in the first place. But I think what we see is, just to wrap up on that, is many more of these responses need to be regionalized. We need to look not just at the Security Council of the UN for the solutions. We really have to look to regional organizations. Security in Europe is provided by the EU. ECOWAS will be one of the foundations of security in the West Africa. SADEC, ASEAN, these need to become bedrock institutions for the countries in that region. For Thank you. Ladies, gentlemen, thank you very much for this panel discussion. Let's give them a hand.